25-year-old Nadine Major lived with her husband Mark and their infant son Dan in an apartment in Willoughby, Ohio in 1980. When Mark returned home from work on January 11, 1980, he found Nadine's body in their dining room. She had been stabbed more than 40 times. Just a few feet from her body was their son, still in his living room playpen. Fortunately, he was unharmed. During the initial investigation, Willoughby Police determined that Nadine's life was taken sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m. There were no signs of forced entry nor evidence that she had been assaulted. Nothing seemed to be missing from the home except the weapon, which came from Nadine's kitchen. The person who took her life did, however, leave something behind. His blood was found on Nadine's shirt. A significant amount of blood belonging to an unknown male was located on Nadine's shirt, said police. Some of the suspect's blood on Nadine's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, which indicated that the suspect was standing on top of Nadine while he was bleeding. A neighbor of Nadine noticed a canary yellow Dodge Dart parked in the rear of their apartment complex around the time her life was taken. It's not a car that belonged to anyone living in the complex. Investigators followed up on the lead, but unfortunately it did not lead anywhere and the case went cold. In 2015, Police received new information based on the DNA found on Nadine's clothing. After establishing a partnership with the Lake County Crime Lab, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, they later teamed up with Lake County Prosecutor's Office and Parabon Nano Labs to build a family tree from the DNA profile, ultimately leading them to Stephen Joseph Simkak through the use of genetic genealogy. Investigators compared the male DNA from blood on Nadine's shirt to one of Simkak's biological children and found a match. People who knew Simkak then confirmed he had owned a canary yellow Dodge Dart back in 1980. Authorities then looked into Simkak's work record from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric Company in Euclid, Ohio, which is less than 10 miles from Willoughby. In 1980, Simkak only missed one day of work, the day Nadine's life was taken. Simkak was due in for a second shift that day and called in sick. Police also learned that, at the time, Simkak had other jobs, delivering flowers for Wycliffe Floral and working with V. Tintonio's Winery in Wycliffe, just a few miles southwest of both his and Nadine's home. Simkak retired in 2002 and moved to Bemis Point, New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo, according to police. He passed away at 79 in 2018, leaving behind a wife, three biological children, and two stepchildren. Nadine's husband, Mark Major, had this to say at a press conference held by police. He stole Nadine from her family and friends. Most of all, he stole Nadine from me and my son. How could he get up every day and look himself in the mirror, knowing what he did? She did not deserve this, he continued. If there's a place in hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. Mark continued that Nadine did not know Simcac leaving loved ones and investigators puzzled about a possible motive. Nadine's son, Dan, had this to say at the press conference. I am angry that Stephen passed away as a free and carefree citizen before he could be identified, as well as caught, and in turn, given the ability for questions to be asked and justice to be served. Eighteen-year-old Barbara Jean Jepson and her husband Joe Jepson lived in Van Nuys, California in January 1956. The couple got married the previous year. Barbara was four months pregnant. Joe worked for the National Air Guard. On January 31, 1956, Joe went to work early in the morning. Barbara was last seen shopping at 12.30 p.m. When Joe returned home, he found Barbara's body in their bed. She had been fatally stabbed. After the gruesome discovery, Joe first covered up his wife with a blanket and then called police. Detectives who responded to the Jepson house that day found several items of evidence, such as a green army jacket with blood and hair follicles in a garage. One witness told police that a person was seen leaving the area that day wearing a green jacket. Another talked about seeing a man with big hands and big knuckles. Unfortunately, investigators back then didn't know how great DNA would eventually be at solving cold cases. So items such as the pillowcases, bed sheets, and a bloody rag found in the sink at the Jepson home were not collected. At the time, detectives believed that what happened to Barbara was linked to a series of assaults in the same area.
They track down every man who's committed similar crimes in the area to question them. Unfortunately, this did not lead anywhere and the case went cold. In 2019, Los Angeles Police Detective Rachel Evans took another look at Barbara's case. It was the very first case she was assigned to after joining the cold case unit. On her first day, a veteran detective handed her the case file and said good luck. By the time she started working on it, hundreds of detectives already combed through it over the past 60 years. It took Evans a week to read through the entire case file. Then she read it a second time and started taking notes. The third time she read through the file, she started noticing a lot of things. One of the things she picked up on was that there was no forced entry at the Jepsons' home. It seemed to Evans that Barbara knew the person who attacked her. She also noticed that no valuables were taken and nothing was out of place. As Evans reviewed the case, it wasn't long before she started focusing on one man, a man from Utah by the name of Mont R. Mers. Mers was born on May 24, 1911, in Mount Pleasant, Utah. In 1931, he married Cleo Reem and the couple had one son and one daughter. They were later divorced and Mers married another woman, Bernice, in the San Fernando Valley. That marriage also ended in divorce in 1945, with Bernice citing cruelty. By then, Mers was an avid gambler, violent to animals, a womanizer, and a raging alcoholic. He was also the suspect in many assault cases. By 1948, he moved in with a woman named Fern Spiva in San Fernando Valley and stayed with her for six years. At the time Mers and Spiva began living together, she had a 10-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. That daughter is Barbara. Evans believed that Mers abused her along the way because that was kind of his modus operandi. He would marry young women who had young girls and he would then go on to abuse them. In 1955, when Barbara married Joe, Mers married his fourth wife. This woman also had a young daughter. In 1960, 15-year-old Marianne Pedroda, who had a horse stable next to Mers's and often rode horses with him, was found fatally stabbed. Then, in 1962, Mers married his fifth wife, Ina. She too had a young daughter. In 1964, Mont Mers was arrested and accused of abusing a 14-year-old girl. Information on that case was hard for Evans to collect because the case file had been destroyed. Although it is clear that Mers was involved in many crimes, this was the only victim for which he was arrested. Also, in 1964, while waiting for the trial, Mers showed up at a hospital with a gunshot wound. He claimed that it was an accidental shooting. Who shot Mers and why was never determined. By 1965, all of Mers's crimes were coming to a head. He was given a polygraph test by police who asked him about what happened to Barbara Jepson. He denied even knowing her. Investigators knew that he was at her funeral and that he knew her since she was 10 because he was married to her mom for some time. The polygraph test results concluded that Mers had definite guilty knowledge regarding the fate of Barbara. On August 15, 1965, while Mers was out of jail and with numerous questions looming about what else he had been involved with, his wife Ina found underwear from a young girl in a drawer in their house. She confronted Mers about whether he had also been abusing that girl. The confrontation was apparently the last straw as Mers proceeded to grab a gun from inside the house. He chased Ina into the street where he fatally shot her. He then went back inside the house and took his own life. Recently, a former stepdaughter of Mers called the police to tell them about 15-year-old Mary Ann Perdroda the girl who often rode horses with Mers and who was stabbed nine times. The stepdaughter told police that she was 10 years old at the time. She remembers that on the day that Marianne lost her life, Mers came into the house with a bloody knife and blood on his hands and clothing. The stepdaughter waited until he and his entire family were no longer alive until she told police. That's how scared she was. She told police that she still had nightmares of him every night. Evans would soon learn that Mers had a pattern of never leaving his victims alone, even after he remarried or when his stepdaughters grew up and moved out of the house. According to Evans' research, five women were seen at Mers' funeral wearing black and crying. Evans said, so he was kind of a womanizer. He had all these women that he connected with and kind of kept. There's a lot of stories around him with these young girls that were abused by him. Until the day Barbara's mom passed away, even though they were no longer married, Mers would still visit her. 
That's why Evans believed on the day that Barbara's life was taken, Murs showed up at her residence and did not need to break into her house. As you'll remember, one of the witnesses saw a man wearing a green jacket with big hands and big knuckles. Big hands and big knuckles were something the Murs family were known for. A drawing of the person who was believed to have committed the assaults in the area showed a man who wore a plaid shirt. Evans said that Murs was also known to always wear a plaid shirt. He was wearing one in his mugshot taken in his 1964 arrest. Most of his victims had their hands bound during their attacks. The same was the case with Barbara. Despite the lack of DNA evidence that still exists today from the crime scene, Evans attempted to use today's DNA technology to help solve the case. After some extensive research, Evans was able to track down Merz's relatives still living in Utah in 2019, including his children. Evans gives big kudos to Draper Police and Unified Police for assisting her investigation. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was served to Merz's 87-year-old son. Merz's son passed away just two weeks after the DNA was collected. Unfortunately, it was ultimately determined there was not enough DNA from the crime scene to compare with the DNA collected from Merz's son. Evans said now that police have it preserved, they will revisit the case about every five years to see if advances in DNA technology get to the point so that the old DNA can finally be tested and compared to familial DNA from Merz. Even though the DNA from the crime scene is too weak to prove 100% it was Merz, investigators believe now in 2022, they have more than enough evidence against Murs that if he were still alive, he would be found guilty of taking Barbara's life. Investigators have also been able to clear other suspects using the DNA. One of these people were Barbara's husband, Joe. Even though he was cleared by the police in the initial investigation, he lived the rest of his life with a stigma surrounding him. Some members of the community questioned his innocence since he was the one who found his wife's body. Joe remarried and had two sons. Although the boys always believed their father was innocent, Evans said it was especially satisfying to be able to call them earlier this year and tell them that their father had conclusively been cleared. On the other side, Evans said Merz's grandchildren were upset when she told them what kind of person their grandfather really was. They had been told that he had passed away in a car accident. The grandchildren took the pictures they had of him out of their homes and threw it away. To solve Barbara's case, Evans said she took a page from the detectives of the 1950s, pounding the pavement and turning over rocks looking for clues. But Evans also has her own gift for striking up conversations with people. People have a lot of info to share, so you sit back and listen to them, she said. In addition to having to prove herself to the veteran detectives, Evans admits she felt solving the case was something she had to do for Barbara Jepson's family so that they could finally have some peace about what happened. She admits that at times, she felt guided as she worked to solve the six decades old cold case. I think people are crying from the dust for justice. Their families need it. I know it's not my family. But there's somebody who's still crying over this. You had a husband that passed away that people always had suspicion about. So for me, you get closure for the families to know that their dad was good or their mom was great. You know you have some peace for them because they lived all these years with no peace. So for me and others I work with, we do this so the families can have rest. I can't bring them back, but the families can have rest.